Hi, thank you for joining us again. We have a wonderful God who has given us of his wonderful grace. He has given us so much that we don't deserve, including and especially eternal life. I'd like to read just four verses before we sing the song together, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. The first is Psalm chapter 107, verse 8. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. The second is Psalm chapter 107, verse 15. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. The third is Psalm 107, verse 21. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. And the fourth is Psalm 107, verse 31. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. Have you got the idea? Yeah, we repeated it four times because it's reported, re repeated four times in the, in the 107th chapter of Psalm. What a wonderful God we have who has given us of his goodness and sh shown his wonderful works to us. Therefore, we should praise and worship him. We're going to sing together, Wonderful Grace of Jesus Reaching to All the Lost by it I have been parted, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty, for the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Robin's going to join me, my wife Robin and Anna on the piano once again. We're going to sing together, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. Wonderful grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall his praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting my spirit free. For the wonderful grace of Jesus, Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than a mountain, sparkling like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me, broader than the scope of my transgression, sin is greater far than all my sin and shame, my sin and shame, oh magnify the precious name of Jesus. Fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Broader 
Greater than the scope of my transgression, sing it. Greater far than all my sin and shame, my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus. Praise His name. Praise His name. Let's pray together. Father, we do worship you. We adore you. We thank you for being our God and choosing us to be your people for the relationship into which you brought us through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that you would be exalted today in our own hearts and minds and lives and through others we might exalt you and honor you and worship you. Father, I pray that you draw us closer to you, to know you better, to love you more and commit ourselves more completely to you. Bless that relationship that we enjoy as we grow in you today, we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Today we're going to study that wonderful truth that we know that we are of God. Again, we know that we are of God. Romans chapter 14 and verse 8 says, For whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live, therefore, or die, we are the Lord's. We are the Lord's. We are of him and praise God for the relationship that we enjoy with him. I belong to Jesus. I am his because of creation. He made me. I am his because of redemption. He bought me back. He purchased me when he paid my sin debt in full. And by the amazing relationship into which he has brought me with him, he is mine as well. That relationship is not a temporary one, not for years of time alone, but for eternity. We enjoy a special relationship with our God. So let's sing together, Now I Belong to Jesus. It's number 458 in your Majesty hymn books, Now I Belong to Jesus. Jesus, my Lord, will love me forever. From him no power of evil can sever. He gave his life to ransom my soul. Now I belong to him. Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me. lost in sin's degradation, Jesus came down to bring me salvation, lifted me up from sorrow and shame. Now I belong to Him. Now I belong to Jesus. my soul for Jesus has saved me freed me from sin that long had enslaved me his precious blood he paved to redeem now I belong to him now I belong to Jesus
a wonderful permanent relationship that I enjoy. I hope you enjoy. If you don't, you can know that you have before we finish this time today as you call on the Lord and trust him as your savior. Well, praise the Lord. He is our God. He is in control. He is always good and does that which is good for us. And so we need to keep our faith in him to pray and ask that he will do that which is according to his perfect will. So in light of that, there are several requests I want to update you with very quickly. First of all, Dawn, uh, Mike Harrington's daughter has stage four cancer and uh, had a, a craniotomy this last week to remove two stubborn lesions on, her, lesions on her brain. So let's be praying for her. Corey's mom is back in the hospital as well. And so let's be praying for her, for he, her healing and recovery. Uh, Jerry is home. Praise the Lord for that. Let's continue to be praying for her for healing and recovery as well. Uh, the dentist's skin infection on his nose is now cleared up on his nose, but it's spreading to his ears and uh, to his neck and his forehead and the top of his head. So they're giving the changing medication, giving him an, another antibiotic and antihistamine in, in case it's an allergic reaction as well. Let's be praying for Dennis that this um, rash will clear up. Um, continue praying for Roberta, Dale's mother-in-law. She had uh, parathyroid removed this week, is doing some better. Let's be praying for her healing. Ember, the prior's niece in Egypt, is uh, with the encephalitis, opened her eyes this week and began some limited speech. Let's be praying for her full recovery from that. Um, things that are coming, Robin is uh, scheduled for surgery on March 8th to have arthritis surgery on her hand. Of course, we're praying that goes well. We uh, enjoy her piano playing and want to prolong that and, and uh, pray that that is not in any way limited. But uh, let's be praying for her, goes in on March 8th, and then March 10th, Chris goes in for his hip replacement surgery. Uh, my sister, Gail and Sergio, you might remember they uh, are in, in Texas and Dallas area and uh, we're without power for almost three days. And as a result of sleeping in extremely cold, it was single digits outside and the, the inside of their house was literally freezing. And uh, so now both of them are very sick. So I'd be praying for them, would appreciate that. And um, I think that's a, the, the new request that we have. Uh, you're probably familiar with the, the ones we have been praying for, let's, so let's pray together. Father, thank you again for the privilege we have to cast all these cares on you, knowing that you care for us, you're gonna do that which is best for us, you're gonna work in these situations, you are not surprised by any of these things, you know what's going on, you know that which has been done and what needs to be done, and God, I pray that you'd work wonderfully. May you give your grace to those who are in need. We pray for Dawn, for her recovery as um, she had this uh, surgery to remove the lesions on, on her brain. Pray, Lord, that you'd bring about full healing on her behalf. We commit her to you. We thank you that Jerry is home and pray for her continued healing. And Lord, specifically, that you'd help her to cope with the pain and that you'd ease that through the, the healing process and, and through other means that you might provide, including your own divine intervention. God, would you just uh, make things more tolerable for her? And we ask that and pray, praise you that uh, you're going to do what's best for her. For Dennis, we pray for his healing from this uh, skin rash, this infection. We pray that it would, it would clear up quickly. And for Roberta, we pray for her recovery. Thank you for that, what you're doing in Amber's life. Amber's life. And Lord, we pray for her that you continue to bring healing from the encephalitis. Lord, we pray for Gail and Sergio that you'll heal them and strengthen them. Thank you for the good progress my sister up in New York, Debbie, has experienced after her appendectomy. Lord, there are many who are dealing with recovery from surgery. Peter is another one, Connie, who didn't have surgery but needs her healing from her arm broken. So many others are, are continuing needs that we have and I pray that you'd answer in providing healing for all those. For Robin, as she goes in on surgery on the 8th of March, we pray for successful surgery and for relief from pain and that she'll be able to, to continue playing alongside of Anna there and, and uh, Teresa and just being a blessing to us here. Father, we pray for Chris, all will go well with his hip surgery. God, I pray for those that are in, in uh, have chronic needs, just continuing things that they deal with that uh, brings about, for many of them, great pain. I pray that your grace would be sufficient for them. And I pray that everyone who is 
in physical need might realize that you will do what you're going to do physically in order to demonstrate that you are God, that you will work things to your glory by, that, by doing that which is best and allowing each one to be a testimony through the trial that they're going through. Father, I pray that they would um, rely on you and grow spiritually through the time of physical ailment. Father, I pray as we recognize our greatest needs are spiritual, that we would turn to you to have those needs as met as well, to rely on you, to commit to you our lives for your glory. We pray that as we study your word this morning, you'd help us to understand it better and to apply it. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. We're going to study 1 John chapter 5, verse 19 today, continuing on in our, our study of the book of 1 John in this final chapter, uh, tackling just one more verse today, verse 19. And so if you have your Bible there and turn 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19, we'll begin by reading this verse together and then study its implication and application to our lives. Let's read together 1 John chapter 5 verse 19. And we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. God, once again, may we understand this truth by your spirit that dwells within us. May we apply it to our lives and honor you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are continuing to deal with a section that is focused on things that we know. From verses 10 through 13, we noted that we know that we have eternal life when we put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Verses 14 and 15 and on into to 16 and 17, we know that God answers our prayers. And when we pray according to his will to accomplish what he desires for his glory, we know God answers prayer. We know that we're saved, that we have eternal life. We know that God answers prayer. And then thirdly, we looked at last week that we know that we have the victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. Victory over sin, victory over Satan, so we don't have to sin any longer. Today, we're going to look at a fourth thing that we know for certainty. We know that we are of God when we receive him as our Savior. In this verse, we see what God intends to be a very real and clear contrast between Christians and the world around us. There ought to be a real difference between us and the world because the world is in wickedness and we are of God. The question I believe that God wants us to ask ourselves, therefore, is, is there a difference between me and the unbelievers around me? Am I different? Am I allowing God to work in me and through me to demonstrate who he is, to magnify him so that men may see him and not me? Am I different than the world around me? Let's delve, delve into this verse and uh, and see a little bit more uh, deeply what God has for us. First of all, we know, we know, we are absolutely sure that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. We know that we are of God when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. When we are saved from our sin, when we call upon the Lord and trust him as our Savior, we are of God. The fact that Christians belong to God then forms, as I've said, this fourth of the certainties that God wants us to know because he has told us. A God who always tells the truth, who tells us what he wants us to know, what we need to know. We know these four things. Today, understanding that we are of God when we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. So we might ask ourselves, from where does John get the terminology of God? Well, he got it where he got much of his terminology from, from the Lord Jesus Christ himself, from the lips of his master. Our Lord himself spoke more than once of believers in the Lord being of God. For instance, in John chapter 8 and verse 47, he said, He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. You don't understand scripture because you're not of God. You hear it and know it if if you are of God. Those are the words of Jesus. So as he gives to this, he gives us the primary idea that is conveyed in the phrase when he says, in strong contrast to that expression, we are of God, referring to those that have not received Jesus Christ as our Savior. In verse 44, 
just three verses prior to the verse we just read of Jesus using the terminology in God. In verse 44, he instead refers to those who don't know Christ as their Savior as being of the devil, of their father, the devil. In verse 44, we'll talk about that more in just a moment. There are only two types of people, therefore, that John acknowledges, two types of people that he teaches us exist in the world, that is the children of God and the children of Satan. Everyone is either a child of God or a child of Satan. Due to sin, all, all people are of their father, the devil. To be of God, we must realize that we are sinners who cannot save ourselves. We have sinned and we have no hope without Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ died and paid sin's penalty for us. If we trust Jesus Christ as our Savior, if we receive him as our Savior, we are born again into the family of God. We are of God, saved from our sin, and given the gift of eternal life. 1 John 3, 10 says, In this the children of God are manifested, are manifest in the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Once again, from 1 John, we see very clearly that there are only two types of people. In this are the children of the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. One or the other. Today you are either of God or of the devil. Let's make sure we're of God. If we are not yet of God, we can be of God. You can be of God today. Know that we are of him. So as we continue, we note that when a person is of God, he then wants to emulate godly character in his life. A person who is of God wants to be like God, wants to be like the Lord Jesus Christ, wants to be growing, to be more godly, more like God every single day. Again, chapter 3 and verse 10 of 1 John. In this, the children of God are manifested and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither is he that loveth not his brother. Two tests are given here of a genuine believer. Someone who is of God. Two tests. What are they? First of all, whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. And secondly, he that loveth not his brother is not of God. So a genuine believer doeth righteousness. And a genuine believer loveth his, his brother. Very clearly said, we have these two tests evidences of whether we are genuinely saved believers in the Lord and of him. Jesus fulfilled both these things for Jesus fulfilled all righteousness. The scripture teaches us he fulfilled all righteousness. Jesus Christ said in Matthew that he did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. And Jesus Christ fulfilled all righteousness. Jesus Christ lives sinlessly perfect that's why he was able to die as our substitute on the cross. He didn't deserve death. He was sinless. We deserved death, but couldn't pay its penalty. Jesus paid it for us. Jesus fulfilled all righteousness. Secondly, Jesus did so because he loves everyone. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But God commendeth his, commendeth his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. They loved us. Jesus gave himself for us. As we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit, he will work in us to perform, to transform us to the image of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We are transformed then to be like him. I know that I am repetitive in the verses that I'm about to share with you. I use them often. I have issues with my memory, but my repetition is not the result of a memory problem. It's a result of a desire that we hear God's truth once again so that we will act on it and believe it. I, need to, we, I believe that we need to reinforce these truths because none of us have yet mastered them. We, we haven't arrived yet. We need to grow in these areas. So first of all, we have 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all 
good works. The Bible is profitable, but the Bible is profitable to us only if we read it, only if we study it, only if we understand it, only if we obey it. The scripture is not profitable to us if we leave our Bible sitting on a shelf. The word of God is profitable, but its profit to us is not gleaned unless we spend time in the word of God, getting from the word of God the truth that he wants us to know so that we can yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit and to obedience, therefore, to the word that he has given. The Bible becomes profitable as we apply it to our lives. It is profitable for doctrine. It teaches us what is right. The Bible is profitable for reproof. For reproof, it teaches us where we have sinned and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so while we know what's right, we realize that we've not all done what's right. We have sinned and are convicted of our sin. Thirdly, it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for correction. The word of God teaches us how we can be forgiven from all of our sin by trusting in Jesus Christ and receiving him as our savior, as our redeemer. And then it teaches us how, after we receive him as savior, after we are a child of God, born into the family of God, we are of him, how we should walk in righteousness. It then teaches us, uh, gives us instruction in righteousness. Teaches us how we should walk in obedience to the Lord, doing what is right before God, as we are empowered by the Holy Spirit who who dwells within. God gives us the scripture so we can know how to live. And God teaches us that we should obey scripture and therefore be holy as he is holy. To be holy is to be set apart, set apart to God. As we are holy, we need to be set apart from to him and then set apart from that which is opposed to him, all ungodliness. Set apart to be holy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 and 17 teaches us that we should be holy. God said, as I am holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, in every aspect of your lives. To be holy, to be set apart to God, to be denying the, 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 the flesh of the sinful desires that it has, to stay away from all ungodliness, sinfulness, and wickedness. We need to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think that we take this command to be holy seriously enough. Well, I hope I'm wrong. But I believe that as contemporary Christians, we don't take seriously what it means to be holy and the need to be holy. Too often we are complacent in our Christian lives, satisfied with the level of spirituality we have and not desiring growth, growth in the Knowledge of God, growth to be like him, growth in holiness. Instead, we allow the doctrines of this world to guide us instead of studying the word of God. Instead, we allow the entertainments of this world to corrupt us away from what God wants us to be. We pursue the pleasures of sin that are short-lived, that last a very short time to captivate us and pull us away from godliness which will have eternal value in our life. We settle for temporal pleasures instead of eternal values. We need to seek that which is eternal, our God, and to be like our God with eternal blessings that will come with it. How does God want to purify you? How does God want to, you to put away greater sin and wickedness from your life and to pursue righteousness and true holiness in your life? That's a question that you need to ask God today. Ask God to reveal to you through his word how you can better live a holy life before him as he lived. What specific issues are there in your life? What specific sins are there that God wants you to deal with, to, to, to acknowledge, to repent from, to confess, and draw from him the grace to have victory over as we discussed last week? May the Lord help us to pursue righteousness and true holiness as a genuine believer will do. Secondly, we learn that a genuine believer from 1 John chapter 3 and verse 10, a, a, a genuine believer will love his brother. Righteous living is living a life of love. 
I say that based on the words of Jesus. Again, another scripture that I repeat often, but we all need to stop and take heed to. Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And his answer was very simple. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Loving God is the first and great commandment. The most important thing we can do to live righteously, right to the commands of God, is to love him with all our heart. And the second is like unto it, Jesus said, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Everything that God teaches us can be summed up in just those two simple commands. So to live righteously is to follow these two commands. Love God with all your heart and love your brother. I fear that we may be like the church of Ephesus. Church of Ephesus is recorded for us in Revelation chapter 2 in that they had left their first love. Ephesus was a great church. They were doctrinally pure and exposed false doctrine. The church was commended for its patience and for its hard work for the cause of Christ. Nevertheless, God said, with all these positive characteristics, nevertheless, he said, I have somewhat against thee. Why? Because they had left their first love. Even their good actions were not being done out of love, the motivation of love for God, for the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to have a sincere love for the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to demonstrate that love by doing what we do and by not doing what we don't do. We do what we do and we don't do what we don't do because we love God, because we love the Lord Jesus Christ, because we want to obey him. That ought to be the reason why we live our lives the way we do. A few weeks ago, we sang the song, A Passion for Thee. O Lord, set a fire in my soul and a thirst for my God. Hear thou my prayer, Lord, thy power to impart, not just to serve, but to love thee with all of my heart. We need to not just serve the Lord, not just do right deeds, but do them for the right motives, for the right cause, because we love the Lord Jesus Christ with all of our heart. How can you love the Lord more? How can you properly express your love for the Lord and respond to his love for you? That's a question we need to ask the Lord as we seek him, as we pursue him and his word and understand what he has for us. The next step then is to love others who the Lord loves. Matthew chapter 22 says that we should love our neighbors. This involves loving the lost enough to share the gospel with them. Love loving the world who has not received Jesus Christ as Savior. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do we love the lost around, around us enough to tell them of the Lord Jesus Christ? But 1 John 3.10 says specifically that we should love our brother, not just our neighbor and those who are, are not saved, but our brother. Those who are born again believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, those with whom we go to church every week, we need to love these people especially. We need growth in this area. We need growth in this area. The reason I'm repeating these verses again and this instruction again is because it is a need that we have as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. I believe that we have a very loving church. We've had our moments to be sure. But there is a genuine love, loving concern between the, the members of our church. But COVID, COVID has stretched us and revealed problems. I can tell you that there are some in our church who don't feel that they're loved and cared about by others. You know that there are many diverging views on the restrictions and expectations that our government has placed upon us. I've tried to lay the foundation for our response from Romans chapter 13, from 1 Peter chapter 2, and from Acts chapter 5. I am sincerely grateful for the fact that by and large you've been willing to talk with me in an attempt to work through this problem and how we should respond. I've had conversations with, with many of you, 
My concern is that you may have been having conversations with me, but not with each other. And when I say not with each other, I'm not saying but having conversations with those who agree with you, but loving conversations, loving conversations with those who don't. There are people on both sides of this issue. It's not all one-sided. There are people on both sides of this issue that do not feel loved. And there's a tendency to place the blame for that on the other side. When reality is we respond to God and to his word, we need to take responsibility how we can better love, how we can do what's right and how we can encourage, edify the church to do what's right. In a loving conversations and confrontation, we can discuss with them the, the, the way that we're gonna work through this problem. Let me ask you, when is the last time that you conveyed love Loving concern for someone else in our, in our church. Someone else close to you, brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ with whom you worship. How long has it been since you've taken time to, to share with those who may not agree with you on this issue that you love them? That you want to work in cooperation with them for the glory of God our Savior. That we're not going to allow this to separate us as believers Jesus didn't command us to love our neighbors ourself unless he takes the wrong position on responding to COVID. He says that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. period. As we interpret our responsibility before God, it seems very clear to me, God has made it very clear that love is the head of the, the headline of, of that reaction. We should love and anything that we do further in cooperation with each other is based on the love that we have for God first and foremost and the love that we have for our brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ secondly. So I ask you, what can you do to show more love to God's people, to your brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ? What can you do to be more loving? There are some very real steps and we'll talk uh, at some point in the, in the relatively near future about some steps we may need to take to be more loving in our actions towards others. May the Lord help us to know what to do and to do it, to express a sincere love for him and a love for others. We know that we are believers in God when we emulate his character, when we are like the Lord Jesus Christ and a person of God then we are taught that is not his own. He does not own his own life, but it is owned by God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. To the Corinthians, the Holy Spirit wrote through Paul, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body, and in your spirit, which are God's. A person belongs either to God or to the evil world system that is Satan's domain. Because the whole world belongs to Satan, Christians should avoid being contaminated by it. Our God-given responsibility is to glorify God in our body and in our spirit. The Gnostics needed to learn that they could magnify the Lord in their body and in their spirits, both of which are God's. Remember that the Gnostics believed the body to be evil. evil. And so many of them believed that it was, not, it was not of any concern what you did with your body as long as you love the Lord with your spirit, as long as you serve the Lord in your spirit, your body's evil, you can't help the body. Let the body, some claimed even, let the body do what, what, what the body wants to do. In contrast to that, we have the teaching of God, whose body it is. And God said that we can have victory over sin. For further on that, we have a DVD, or this is on, online on YouTube. You can look at last week's message, the victory that God has promised over sin. We can have victory over sin. We don't have to sin any longer. We now belong to God. And we need to glorify God in our body and in our spirit, which are his. We need to learn how we can magnify God in our body and our spirit. It belongs to God. He will enable us to use it for him and for his glory as we are of him. Some of those who have not received 
the Lord Jesus Christ, would take great offense at me claiming that there's only two kind of people, those who are of God and those who are of Satan. Some of those who are of the devil would not like to understand that or to believe that or to claim that. There are many who believe that they are of God who are not of God. And this is why the test for genuine believers is given to us. This is, this is why we need to look at God's truth and know God's truth so that we're applying God's truth because we want to know, are we of God? Or, as Jesus said in John chapter 8 and verse 44, ye are of your father the devil. These were religious people. And yet he said, ye are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. They were of their father the devil. And while some people may be offended at that, we're not going to leave that position until we understand we're in that position. We're not going to seek remedy for our sin until we understand that we're sinners. In order to get saved, we got to first get lost. Now, we are all lost. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but not all recognize that they're lost. So some aren't looking for any help because they don't know that they need help. They don't understand that they're still in sin and of their father, the devil. Instead, they're pursuing after their own sinful desires, thinking that they're going to be okay. Well, if we're not of God, we're not going to be okay. The only way to be okay for eternity is to know God, to be of God, to be saved from our sin by God and to be of him. When we are of him, our lives are owned by him and need to be used for his glory. There are only two kind of people in this world, those who are of God and those who are of the devil. So we need to make sure we are of God because we know that the whole world lieth in wickedness. It lives in sin. It lives to the glorification of the flesh, sinful lusts and desires. The world is a system that is contrary to God and contrary to godliness and thus is very wicked, is in wickedness. Verse 19 that we're studying of 1 John 5, we know that we are of God and we in the whole world lieth in wickedness. The last word of this phrase, wickedness, may also be translated as the wicked one. Not a wrong translation by any means. What I'm suggesting is in the, from the Greek, it can be translated in, in either way. In fact, there are examples in scriptures of both. It's here used that, we, that, the, that the world lives in wickedness. But there are three times that this very same Greek term is used, very same way, three other times in this short epistle. In 1 John 2.13, it says, Ye have overcome the wicked one. Wicked one, that same term. In the very next verse, 1 John 2, 14, ye have overcome the wicked one. And in 1 John 3 and verse 12, Cain speaks of Cain, who was of that wicked one. They, are, they were of wickedness because of, their, of, that, of that wicked one. The wicked one is the leader of this world system that lie, lieth in wickedness, that lives in wickedness, that is full of wickedness. Second. Corinthians chapter 4 and verse, verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest, they, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan is described, here scriptures describe the wicked one as the God of this world. He is not God. Notice it's a small g. He is worshipped as God. He is not God. He will never be like God, though he had, the, the, he had ambition to, to, to be so. He will never be like the Most High. He is not God, but he is a God to this world. He is the one in control, ruling this sinful world around us. In John chapter 12, verse 31, it says, Now is the judgment of, of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. The prince of this world, the one again with authority, the one who rules over the wickedness of men and encourages that greater wickedness and rebellion against God. He will be judged by God. He has been, will be ultimately condemned. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, 
according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Again, it is spiritual wickedness. The prince of the power of the air is the one that we are in battle against, the one who is our enemy, this wicked one of the world, the one who is promoting wickedness all around us. And in all these passages, it's taught that Satan has control over the world, particularly the, the heathen, rebellious world rejecting Christ. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The heathen world is ruled by the wicked one, the one who is permeated with, with wickedness, and thus the world around us is, is permeated, is saturated with, with wickedness because it comes from he who is promoting that because he is wicked himself. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 and 22 says, Because that when they knew God, they glorified not him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. The Holy Spirit is here teaching us about those who knew God, but glorified him not as God. They knew God, but they did not receive God. They rejected him. They rejected his truth. And so professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, God deniers. What is the lifestyle of those who rejected God? Let's continue in Romans 1, down to verse 28, 28 through verse 32. And then, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, which you note that all men come to know there is a God. Creation around us tells us that, but unfortunately many reject that truth and fail to receive him as God, the creator, and so come up with lies that they choose rather to believe. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge, and because of that, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Here we have a a long list of, of sins that saturate this world. The sins that, that, that this world is so guilty of in, in many of its facets. And no one person needs to commit every one of these sins, but all are involved of, of these types of sins and others listed for us in the word of God. And why? I, I, I thought it interesting. There's one phrase that caught my attention right in the middle of all this. Did you notice it in verse 30, the second, the second description? haters of God. I spent a while meditating on the fact that, uh, that, that our country has been wrapped up by many with a hatred of our former president, President Trump. The hatred that they have for this man has, gone, has caused them to go to incredible lengths and do incredible things that are almost inconceivable that I certainly didn't see coming, and I think most people probably didn't. Hate has motivated them to do that which they would not ordinarily do, has corrupted them to, 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 a, to a thinking that goes beyond what any of us would consider normal. Well, let me get off the political realm. Sorry for that, uh, for, that, for that dive into the political realm. But we bring this, to, I say that to say this, think about those who hate God and what would they be willing to do because they hate God. For many, their hatred of God goes way beyond their hatred for President Trump. For many, their hatred of God is motivating them to sin and to do sins that are inconceivable to many of us, just un unbelievable. And yet they're pursuing after these things because they hate God. 
We need to make sure that we don't allow ourselves to in any way get bitter against God, but that we love the Lord our God with all of our heart, that we submit to him and recognize that God is immeasurable, that God is unlimited in every way, unlimited in knowledge, unlimited in power, unlimited in, by, by time and space, Un, unlimited. He is our infinite God whom we follow. And he, because he is all-knowing, all wise and all powerful, he's able to do that which he knows is best for us. So we need to trust God. We don't always see and understand all what's going around, but God knows, he sees it all, he's handling it all. We need to trust our God. We need to love our God and not allow ourselves to get bitter against him, not allow ourselves to be among those who reject him, certainly because of their rejection are given over to a reprobate mind. The world is fully given over to wickedness. The world lieth in wickedness. It is saturated with wickedness. Believers are not therefore to love the world. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Don't flirt with those things of the world. Don't have anything to do with it. It will corrupt you. It is not for your good. God forbids it not because he's trying to withhold something good, but he's trying to withhold something terrible from happening to us by our involvement which that is wicked, that which is wicked and is corrupt. John chapter 16, verse 33 says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Listen, we don't need to get discouraged and depressed today about people who hate the Lord who hate God and godliness and are doing all kinds of wicked, terrible sins around us. There are things that are being accepted and pushed by our media that is, is mind-blowing, that would not certainly have been accepted years and years ago. And we see the, the, the level to which corruption is growing and being accepted by mainstream America. Listen, don't get involved in loving the world. Understand that in Christ you'll have peace and not outside of Christ. You're not going to find peace in the world. You're not going to find joy in the world. It's only in Christ. So in the world, ye shall have tribulation. If you are of Christ, if you are of God, then the world is not going to like you. You're not of the world. You're not of the devil. You are not of their crowd. You are separated from them. But be of good cheer. God has overcome the world. God has all power. He is victorious. We need to claim that victory in Jesus. Victory over the world, victory over wickedness, victory over the wicked one. So as I close, I ask you two questions. First of all, are you of God or are you of the devil? To be of God, you need to trust Jesus Christ as your savior. If you're of the devil, you have never done that. You are of the devil if you have never done that. I don't mean to be inflammatory by that statement. I just want you to see the simple truth that scripture points out to us. If you're not of God, but would like to be of God, you can be of God today. He that comes to God, God will in no wise cast out. God will not turn you away if you want to be saved. God loves you. He longs for you to trust in him as, as your savior. He sent his son to die for you. Will you believe on him? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and accept him as your savior from sin. Will you call upon the Lord for the forgiveness of sin and receive the gift of salvation that he freely offers you? The only thing you need to be saved is to accept the gift. It's not what you're doing for God. It's what he has done for you. Will you receive the gift by calling on him in faith? pray and say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I don't deserve salvation, but I thank you that you love me, that Jesus Christ died for me. I trust in you and I receive the gift of eternal life. Forgive my sin and be my savior in Jesus name. Amen. With a simple prayer, just a simple prayer. It's not the words that matter. It's the faith that calls on the Lord. Will you trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior? And the second question I ask then is, are you living like one who is of God? We know that we trust Jesus Christ. We are of God. Are you living like it? Are you acting like it? 
behave yourself as a child of God. Seek his forgiveness for your sins that you have committed against him and yield to him. Yield yourself to the Holy Spirit that dwells within you for the grace and power to be obedient. Will you act like a child of God? Let's close in prayer together. Father, again, we want to thank you for your word, scripture that's been given to us to teach us. Lord, we have learned it's time now for us to obey. We need to yield ourselves to you and allow you to use us to be a testimony to those around us of your divine power, of your ability to change us and make us new creatures in Christ Jesus, to put away that which is old and sinful and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, righteousness and true holiness. Lord, help us, we pray, to be more like you today, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's turn again in our songbooks as we're gonna sing one final song together. It is number 429 in your majesty hymn books. Take time to be holy. Let's think about these words and allow them to challenge us today to take time to be holy. Still trust in his word. His word is not going to do us any good. Can I just say this one more time? His word's not going to do any good sitting on a shelf. The Bible's not going to be profitable to us unless we get it down and read it, study it, meditate on it, memorize it, and obey it. Will you get into the word this week? The Lord bless you.